Let's start off with uh, stories from Nigeria, where the Speaker of Nigeria's House of Representatives, Honorable Tajuddin Abbas, has condemned the mass abduction of pupils in Sokoto State by bandits. About 15 pupils were reportedly abducted from an Islamic school in Gida Bukuso, that's Gida local government area of Sokoto State, on Saturday. The abduction follows the previous ones in Bornu and Kaduna states within a week, which the speaker had condemned in strong terms. Now joining me on the program to shed more light on this is Adekoya Onyekachi, that security expert, and of course uh, Joseph Babatunde Sotome, that's Chairman Advanced Secure 360 Solutions Limited. Gentlemen, thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. All right, uh, let me start off uh, with, uh, of course, uh, you, uh, I mean, what do you make of um, uh, the abduction, you know, that seems to have resurfaced? Some have compared this recent abductions to that of the Chiba girls, you know, that uh, Nigeria witnessed uh, many years ago, you know, over a decade ago. What do you make of this recent um, uh, resurfacing of, of these activities? Of course, to you, Adekoya. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Um, well, a, a sad event again. Um, I wouldn't, um, of course, go down the route of uh, being an alarmist, <clears throat> but um, the issues are quite entrenched. They are beyond what we see on the surface. Um, it's just a cyclical wave of opportunistic crime. And what that we just um, felt is that, firstly, um, we have a system that is not working, um, a system that is reactive, not proactive, uh, a system that is behind the eight ball when it comes to addressing the contemporary issues, plus the environmental threat factors uh, within Nigeria's environment. So I think that's the bigger problem. Mm. Um, then, of course, uh, my thoughts, of course, with the families who are affected by this, uh, but really um, it's one occurrence um, too many reoccurring without a clear answer. What we will see now is um, an immediate knee-jerk reaction from the security forces. We'll see increased deployments, we'll see increased police presence, we'll see political statements, um, and that, that will be it. Um, mm. And that will be till another event occurs, sadly. That's the way it is. Um, and of course, I we hoping that such doesn't happen. But let's listen to Baba Tunde on this. What do you make of this uh, recent very unfortunate event or series of events uh, talking about the abduction of pupils across schools in some parts of the country? It's shameful. I'll be frank, it's really, really shameful. Looking at the giant of Africa, we have this thing reoccurring again and again and again. Uh, it's something that we need to hide our heads in shame. I expected by now that uh, a lot of generals will have been dismissed. These are innocent children, children that are not armed, innocent children that are working towards to be better in the future. Leaders of tomorrow are taking away not 10, not 20, not 50, we're talking of 200 plus, taking mm. away innocent children. Mm. And you, you, I mean, are we not ashamed to even, we, we, should, be, we should be hiding our heads as security experts and, and generals in this country. It's a shame to, to be all aware, we have disappointed our generations to come. Innocent children that schools taken away, and, and I mean, and, and now nobody's dismissed. Nobody, no, no, no contract is terminated. Nobody is dismissed. No head is rolling. This is what happened when there, there was a prison break. Nobody's dismissed. For heaven's sake, how long are we going to continue like this? This is becoming it, it, it's disgraceful. It's disgraceful for us to lose children of hundreds. Look at this study from Chippewa girls went down to Bauchi. Now, 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 this again. Come on. I mean, if, if they are children of a government, I mean, Baba, so they ju just, just to, 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 to cut in their bit. I mean, in their bit. Uh, just to cut in, you know, in, in their bit. Let's look at even the modus operandi, particularly of that of Kaduna State. Over 200, uh, precisely about 280, if not 287, uh, individuals were abducted. That's a large number. And, of course, uh, some have argued that it would even take time, you know, to be able to rally, gather those kids, 
put them you know, in, uh, in vehicles and then convey them over long distances. And there was really no response. I mean, that's enough time to buy security forces uh, to respond swiftly to such acts. So uh, my question to you is this. What does this reflect of uh, the security architecture of the country, particularly in that part of town? Our intelligence gathering is completely new. I'm still, I'm still with you, Baba Tunde. I'm still with you, Baba Tunde. Our intelligence gathering is complete zero. I'll be frank. All right. Uh, Baba Tunde, if you can hear me, we're having a bit of, of difficulty trying to hear you. Maybe. Uh, you might just you know want to uh, look at it from your end maybe log in and log out uh, i mean join the program again but let me let me stay with you at decoya now looking at the modus operandi of these bandits uh they abduct you know uh, individuals in large quantity sometimes they even travel for miles and miles and uh, it looks like they are not there's no form of resistance i mean that's quite a lot of time you know if you're to look at the logistics of all of this what does this reflect of our, you know, security architecture. Yeah, like I, like I said in my opening statement, it just shows that um, we are facing what is classed as um, a wicked problem. It also shows a level of um, situational awareness on the part of the attackers, because um, remember that um, some of these people form a network of um, um, transnational criminal groups, mm. and um, they understand terrain, they understand geography, topography, um, they know how to use the terrain to their advantage. Um, again, they also have local intelligence and they're quite embedded with the local populace. Um, they can smell and tell when government posture is beginning to wane in a particular area and then they sense an opportunity uh, within the sets of tactical considerations that they make they decide the parts of least resistance. Um, it will also interest you to know that they also employ some form of community liaison to also smoothen their ways um, across certain communities to their eventual hideout. Uh, so this, this doesn't really tell much about the persons in the security forces or the capability of the individuals. What we have is a systemic failure um, and what's causing the systemic failure is that we run a centralized system of um, policing. And initiative is not really local. And as long as initiative is not local, listen, every sensible approach to security is a local, local approach. Mm. You know, then you build on um, the local approach, you then layer on that. Um, a, a wider integrated network um, of security systems and programs um, that then tries to confront the issues. So if you say, what does it tell of our current security setup? It just tells what it has been telling for the past uh, 20 years. You know, Nigeria has increasingly become unsafe and it's, the, the trend is being sustained. Uh, we shout all we can this year um, if nothing is done, we are, we are likely to experience an increased level of insecurity in 2025, 2026, as it has been since 1999. So clearly what we have as a setup is failed, will fail, and continue to fail. So that's all this is telling me. Uh, we, we don't have to go into how did they um, access the school, how did they pick up the book? Yeah, some post But, but you, you, you said something about uh, security being, you know, a local approach in terms of tackling, you know, uh, uh, challenges uh, within regions. Uh, I mean, that brings us to the conversation around the state policing, and uh, which, of course, has been in the front burner or on the front burner for years now. Uh, do you think that, to a very large extent, that will resolve the issues on ground? Or oh, it's more around issues of training, competence, and uh, resources available to these uh, combatants to be able to fight toe-to-toe -to -toe with uh, these bandits? You, well, you have not asked a simple question at all. Mm. Um, so will state police resolve the issues? No, it will not. 
But will it bring the issues to as low as reasonably possible? Absolutely, yes, it will. So that's to answer your question. The next question, is it a capability training problem? Yes, there is a bit of that. But it's about the structuring and the posture. Um, you can't play football hopping on only one leg. I mean, there could be a different type of sports like that. If you are not postured correctly, you can't do much in the game. So, yes, capability training, resources are the issues. But um, our case can be likened to a 75-year-old man um, chasing in a 100-meter dash, an 18-year-old, 25-year-old who is in, in his prime. You would never catch up. So we are running a belated, outdated approach to security. The approach that sought to ensure only redeem protection uh, in a time when if you just put some Mopo and some military people in the field, you know, there would be uh, maybe people disturbing the peace will just beat the retreat and then go back to wherever they are coming from. But you now have um, fleeting forces, greatly dispersed, highly mobile, and tactically aware, who are more than willing to take on the military, the police, and just about any government security forces formation that confronts them. So you see, there must be a change in strategy. Mm. Um, they, so that's the real problem. It's not a people. I'd always argue that um, it's not service chiefs, because we've changed several service chiefs, and it is clear that the matters are beyond the people. The matters you, you are, are political, not, they are societal. Okay, you're saying it's not a function of the service chiefs. No, it's not at all. Uh, but but at some all. would also say that leadership plays a key role in uh, nipping many of these problems in the board. That if the leadership is strong enough, you know, it has a way of inspiring, you know, uh, the followers to want to do more and give in their best. Absolutely. Some might even tell you, okay, take an example, the NDLEA, for instance. Since the current, you know, uh, head, uh, which is Abuba Marwa, you know, has been the leader, uh, people are beginning to see some sort of changes in terms of their tactics, deliverables, and all of that. Some will take you back to also that of NAPDAC. So uh, do you think that uh, leadership in this context, you know, isn't vital also? We, we very profound respect to the NDLA and um, the fine gentleman retired officer there. Um, the problems confronting the NDLA are quite um, enormous beyond what their current setup can deal with. You may say and argue that um, there is a bit more publicity um, in the activities of the NDLA, which is positive propaganda, is part of a tool in statecraft. Uh, but you cannot say that um, there are no drugs on the streets. I mean, you are in uh, Wemco Road here, uh, your near neighbors here on a certain Friday, Saturday night is awash with hard drugs. Uh, so that's for the NDLA. Again, um, again, it's not about the forces, the formation of the people. The problem is about the structure, the structure that you have. Uh, what we have is a top-to-bottom approach, a top-to-bottom centralized approach that loses nuance at local levels. You see, no two threat conditions are the same. No two conditions of a state are the same. No two conditions of a local government are the same. When I make the argument to say every sensible approach to security should be local, it's, it's, it's where you then bring in local initiative. Um, what works in point A may not work in point B, but you can draw lessons from point A and take that and then adapt to the local conditions in point B and then move forward to a point C or a point D. Uh, once you lose, um, lose sight of nuance at a local level, you will continue to be behind. Let me, let me just make this even very simple. Uh, if you had, for example, in Kaduna State, a state police system, you class their weapons to maybe service pistols, uh, double barrel, you class them to have a tactical crack team, like a SWAT team, in limited number with limited ammunition, then they fan out into the communities, they have weapons, uh, they can go and confront threat level threats as the threats are morphing. They can act as a force multiplier also to the federal forces. Uh, they can condor off an area and, you know, maybe do some blocking operation 
for the federal forces to come in. So you have a multiplied uh, effect of force posture across the country. When you take that out of the way, you then go into the criminal justice system. Having a criminal justice system that is effective, that is localized, that is based and keeping up with the trends in the local community, okay, yeah. and, and you, then, you then go from there. So the problem we have in Nigeria mm. is that we seek first public order without pursuing public safety. Okay, now we, we, we've seen some sort of, uh, will I call it local security you know, architecture being uh, put together in uh, some states and some regions. For instance, in the West, we know of the Amotekun, and we know that uh, they have something similar also in some parts of uh, the North, right? Uh, but again, the conversation as regards kinetic and non-kinetic approach comes to the fore in resolving many of these issues. We've seen where some state governors have advocated, you know, us, officials have actually advocated that, you know, the non-kinetic approach uh, is way more effective in handling uh, many of these issues. We've seen cases also where some bandits uh, tagged as repentant bandits are sort of uh, reoriented and uh, uh, you know put back into society. So my question to you is this: In this kind of uh, what I call it uh, localized insecurity situation that you know many parts of, uh, uh, particularly in northern Nigeria, is faced with, which approach do you think is rather you know lasting, the kinetic or non-kinetic approach? Yeah, so this is a chicken or egg situation, really. Um, you then ask the question, which comes first? Um, context is everything again. Uh, without security, you cannot have economic prosperity. Uh, without economic prosperity for all, um, social disparity uh, will increase, and that will lead to restiveness. Again, once you have restiveness, you are going to have, now need to invest more in security, uh, but you can't overinvest in security and then leave other sectors because that will create another set of societal imbalance. So um, there are a number of complementing factors that must go together. In our 2019 strategy, I think we phrase we we national security strategy, we framed it correctly to say that human security will be the pivot, the pillar upon which we pivot towards a new security vista in the country. And for you to do human security correctly. Um, I would digress a bit because you then have to go into what is in the concurrent list, what is in the exclusive list, and what's in the residual list. Um, some scholars have argued that the elements in the concurrent list, the federal government should not be implementing those elements, but rather create agencies that will form standards, provide governing policy, and pull out of those concurrent lists and leave the implementation for the states at the subnational level to implement and take some other revenue making opportunities and unlock that potential. Because you had mentioned the North and Amoteco. I've, also, I've asked journalists to research. In some of those formations in some of the North, those people who are armed are not paid. You can quote me anywhere. Some of them are not paid. The last I checked, some of them were earning 20,000 Naira a month and they are carrying weapons. And if you say Amotekun or Ebubaago, for example, what is the ratio of those people to the population they seek to be policing? So you may argue that there is some microeconomic, geopolitical, socioeconomic imbalance that is also constraining and impacting on security, uh, and that maybe a general holistic rework has to be um, attempted you know, uh, which is the point I'm making, really. The problem is not with the formations. The problem, again, is with the political, the political class, their, their appreciation of the depth and size of the problem, the will to confront the issues and to make concessions, and importantly, for Nigeria to begin to run a true federalism, because it's a bit of a funny situation. The, the subnationals can make laws, they can adjudicate over these laws, but they cannot enforce those laws. Mm. So there are structural imbalances that are, you know, throwing off um, some of the efforts being made. So yes, I agree with you that security alone would not resolve the issues, and that the state governments, as constituted based on how the con constitution is framed, may not be able to fully handle all the costs that goes because security is very expensive. That goes into ensuring 
a holistic security program for the states. Oh, okay, yeah. Oye, Oye Kachi, I, I might just need to, of course, uh, uh, go to Babatunde uh, next. Babatunde, I'd like to also know your reaction to uh, some of the things uh, that has been said, particularly on the issue as regards uh, state police being uh, a way forward in terms of solving uh, many of the security insecurity uh, situations that we have, particularly across the country. And just in addition, What's your take on self-defense, uh, private citizens, you know, having access to arms? Okay, if you can hear me, please kindly unmute your device so that we can hear you. Okay, while, of course, uh, we are still trying to connect with uh, Babatunde, let me know uh, what your take is, on uh, private individuals having access to arms, to bear arms. We know that uh, Senator has actually been pushing for that, that Senator Ned Umoko saying that uh, looking at uh, the uh, situation of things in terms of security, uh, one of the ways forward is not the only one, by the way, public officer who has been pushing for that, that citizens should be allowed to defend and protect themselves, you know, by being given access to arms. What's your take? Um, I, I mean, I don't, I don't want to respond to uh, the senator, um, politicians have a knack for making very colorful statements and taking certain steps to make it look as though they are doing something about the problems, when in truth, um, it's just a dance that is quite unnecessary. The Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria as is guarantees every Nigerian the right to bear arm. But on a proviso that the commissioner, resident commissioner of police in the respective state will be the licensing authority for you to bear arms. So if you want to bear arms, uh, there's a level of arm that you can get. Um, and so, it's, it's I, class. So, so you're saying that by law, uh, the law, the Nigerian constitution allows a private uh, citizen access to arms. But 100 percent and on certain conditions being met mm. that you are mentally stable, you have no criminal record and some other conditions they have there. And again, that um, the muscle velocity, the class of the weapons have to be what is provided for in law. You can approach the police um, and state the reason why you should have um, weapons, and then um, you will get one. Mm. But so I don't know what uh, the, uh, okay. the distinguished uh, senator <laughs> is talking yes. about. Yeah. OK, but, but do you think that, um, I mean, it's the way to go? It's not what I think or I don't think. The right to self-defense is enshrined in the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Um, but the problem I would see from this, and in terms of weapon classification, is that there's a principle of um, this principle called force continuum, where you apply force as force becomes necessarily, and then you match force with force. So in the principle of self-defense, if you come against me with a, a rifle uh, that has an effective killing range of about, say, 1,000 meters, and I have in my defense a weapon that is limited to, say, 500 meters, then the principle of self-defense is warped because I don't stand a chance of defending myself except the muscle velocity, the range, and the firing capacity of the weapons match each other. Uh, but we also don't want to create a chaos, some chaos in society, where people just carry high-powered um, uh, rifles just for the sake of carrying it and assuming that a risk will occur. So within the ambit of reasonable force, self-defense can be very challenging uh, because if you have a weapon and somebody is coming against you with a knife, um, if you shoot to kill, uh, it will be difficult to prove to the judge that um, your life was completely at risk if you could have shoot to maim and not kill. So uh, there's a whole lot that goes into bearing arms, the responsibility of it, the training for it, and all that goes into it. So it's not a linear conversation. Mm. Uh, it's not a linear conversation. Importantly, there's a reason why you have the police. There's a reason why you have the army. The police are citizens drawn from the society, given the right of the people 
to bear arms on behalf of the people and in pursuit of the interests of the people. But do you think they are better motivated? Do you think they are well motivated? Uh, I mean, men of the security forces, do you think in terms of salary, uh, remuneration packages and all of that, you know, access to resources, you know, to work, you know, efficiently, are they properly, you know, motivated to actually take up many of these uh, dangerous tasks? Well, barring their right to protest, which has already been abrogated by certain laws um, in the country, um, I don't hear them complaining. So, so a few of them I'm have not, come on not social not, media to yeah, actually complain. Uh, and uh, many of the follow-up stories we hear is that many of, quite a number of them are, you know, are, are, are punished. Well, I'm not a spokesman for them. I would do a hold brief for them. Uh, but yes, uh, I don't know who is paid what he is worth in this country today as is. Um, I can see you looking very fresh. Perhaps uh, <laughs> your employers are paying you the, what you're worth and you are very motivated to do your job. Uh, but um, I, I can't say the same thing um, for them. Yes, I'm aware of what their salary grading is. You'll be shocked. You if, I to say you, it. if I tell you what the salary of No, I mean, of please, the, feel free. You no, can, no, I, I would mean, not. You just invite them. Find out what the salary of the commissioner of police is. No, I, I mean, for, for, I mean that, uh, that would there was give... A, there was an assistant okay. commissioner of police. You can give a range, there even if you don't want to be assistant commissioner precise. of police who got knocked down by Okada while she was trying to cross the road. And that created a lot of noise in some security platform to say that uh, if she lacked decorum, how would she be hit down by an Okada and all that and all that. And I, <laughs> I asked the question, how much is the salary of these people? What are the work tools that they are given? Mm. Under what work conditions do they have to work? Uh, that's why I say the investigative journalists should investigate. That's why you are members of the Ford Estate of the REM. Uh, security impacts on everybody. So let somebody do a deep dive. Uh, you can get the records and you show it there. Find out how much the police stations are given every week to operate all the vehicles they have in their division. So if the police tells you that there is no fuel, uh, they are not lying. Uh, we cannot even produce the level of munitions that we need in this country as a country. And uh, we see our military um, putting um, up infographics now on the number of terrorists killed. and So, so we just have a military that has been over-domesticated, doing the work of a federal police force basically, not even what a National Guard should do. So there's a, there's a serious problem with security and how it is run, the assumption of what is working and what is not working. And the notion that because you're a retired this, retired that, you understand security. No, sir. Public safety. Public safety is different from public order. What Nigeria should be pursuing is public safety, which encompasses the whole thing about ensuring that the, the citizens are safe, have a feeling of being safe, and can go about pursuing value, understanding and being reassured that the environment in which they have to operate is safe, secure, sound, and even if something were to happen, response will be quick. So we, we don't, you don't feel that in Nigeria. All you see is um, people blaring sirens, um, policemen, on stop and side duties. It's only in third world countries you see that uh, policemen carrying assault rifles like an AK-47. Those weapons are intrinsically very dangerous. They are not even meant for public outings. Uh, in terms of safety hazard, those assault rifles they carry are a serious hazard to society. The police should mm. be carrying pistols when they are going about their lawful business. As you see in most developed countries, you know, they, they put those... Um, dangerous weapons away, I mean, so they become approachable. So there are a number of um, um, very irritating, if I may use the word, issues that we have with the way security is approached. But importantly, our security culture is poor. The level of security awareness is poor. Security education is not what it should be. If the lawmakers themselves don't know uh, what security should be, then um, how many retired um, um, maybe former law enforcement person are in the legislature. How many of the members of the House of Assembly, the Senate, go for a course in security? The ones that have to do with the um, Committee on Intelligence, on how many of them take courses in intelligence? Mm. So there are a number of issues, really. All right. Uh, on your country, I mean, I would have loved us to dwell on this particular topic, but we are pressed for time. 
on uh, this first uh, half of the program. But thank you so much for your contribution. Adekoya, when you catch your security experts, once again, I uh, deeply appreciate Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right, man. Thanks also to Joseph uh, Babaton. They will join in at some point. Chairman Advanced Secured 360 Solutions Limited. Well, we need to go on a break at this point. When we return, we will be going to South Africa, a country that is gearing up for its presidential polls. Updates up next. <music>